see so many people here. Um, I sent out a big giant email blast last night, but I don't want to inflict that on all the people that I did yesterday in the future. So uh, I have two lists here. Uh, if you'd like to get seminar announcements, yeah, this is the mailing list. If you want to get future announcements about the seminar, you can sign up here. And you can also do that online and uh, change your answer at any time. Um, some people here are students who may be taking this class for one unit of credit. And so for those students, your sign-in sheet is this pink one right here. So we'll pass both of those around. Um, this is my very first class at UCSD, so I'm tremendously excited to be here. Uh, and it's really fun to see both a lot of people that I know well and also a number of people who I, I haven't met yet. And um, when I was thinking about starting up here, one thing that I realized was that a lot of what we see in design uh, has changed dramatically in the last decade. And I see that from my home field of human-computer interaction, where the way that we used to design uh, human-centered software usually went something along the lines of you would start building a piece of software, and when you got it most of the way done, uh, you would find somebody, and you would drag them into your lab or office or whatever you had, and you would watch them use your software. And when they swore, you would write down what happened and how you might fix it. And then you would fix that bug and then bring somebody else into the lab. And you would watch when they swore, and then you would fix that bug. And you would r rinse and repeat until you ran out of money or time. And then you would release your software into the world. And because it was shipped on some sort of physical media, you had no idea what happened when anybody used your software. So like, you release the software, what happens? Now, in the last two decades or so, uh, a number of things have changed. Uh, one of them is the web. And in response to the web, designers have, I think, really smartly decided to change how they go about design. And what we're seeing now a lot more often is people trying stuff out online. So the costs of putting something up and just seeing what happens are a lot lower. Um, also, one thing that we've seen is um, it used to be the case that when you were designing software, you get in a big argument among the design team. And you want to know, well, do we go this way or do we go the other way? And if you ship something out on a CD-ROM or, or similar, and you'll never have a chance to change it easily or easily gate, gather data about how it's used, um, you got to pick. And so like, there's a big fight with whiteboard markers and erasers. And whoever wins that dust up, that's the way the software gets built. On the web, what I'm hearing more and more uh, from friends and colleagues that build web services is you can try building it both ways, roll them both out, and see which one people use more, find more engaging, or some other measure that matters to you. And that's a big shift in how design happens. And so the designer's role is no longer like in the days of Mad Men, where you like sit in a room and figure out what the one answer is. What I'm seeing more and more is that the designer is being asked to say, of the billion possible options, what are a couple that we should explore further? And you try a couple in parallel and have a chance to get feedback from the world about those. And so I think that's a big shift. So uh, creativity is still required. Decision making is still required. But now you're trying to find three good options, not one good option. Um, I think another thing that, uh, that we're seeing as design expands out into the world is that once you've released software, you have the opportunity to gather a lot more data. And that's also changing how we do uh, both research and how designers work in the world. Um, to introduce myself a little bit, uh, my original degree was in art, and I was originally trained as a graphic designer. And I thought I would go into art and technology kinds of stuff from the art side. Um, I got drawn in by computer science, and, and that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years. Um, but along the way, I became really uh, inspired by the studio model of education. I think there's a lot in how design training happens, which is extremely powerful. And you see that here in this photograph I took of the, of the product design loft at Stanford, 
where there's all sorts of stuff in the room. You got this upside down umbrella, umbrella and a Barbie doll and there's a pair of taken apart shoes and all this other stuff. And anybody who is in that room has a sense of what's going on. So I opened today by talking about the exciting promise of the online world. Um, but now we're getting a chance to see, well, this thing, which is 200 years old, and in fact the studio model of education dates back to 1819 with the opening of the Ecole de Beaux Arts in Paris. And it's endured for 200 years, I think for a lot of good reasons. The foremost among them being the community power that's enabled both by ambient awareness uh, and also by peer collaboration. Interestingly, when I got uh, to my computer science classes, I saw something very similar. Um, back in the days of Unix workstations, which weren't that long ago, um, there was one room when I was in college where all of the computers were that were usable for computer science classes. And that meant that every single student in computer science from first semester freshmen all the way up to PhD students was in the same room and sitting shoulder to shoulder. And there were just slightly too few computers for the number of students who wanted to use them, which meant that you went up to whatever desk became available. And so you randomly sat next to peers from across a variety of ages. And the social mixing that happened was really valuable in terms of you got to see, when I take computer graphics, what am I going to learn? Or I have a seg fault, can you help me? Uh, or somebody else has a seg fault, can I help them? And there were a lot of benefits that happened here. And uh, my friend Carrie Carey Helios told me when we were talking one time that uh, when MIT got rid of the Athena cluster, there was a real sense of social community that was lost. So a lot of what I'm uh, going to talk about today in my own work and also what I see as possibilities for design at large in, in general are thinking about opportunities for community, whether those are communities of learners or communities of practitioners or communities of all sorts of kinds. Um, so we have this shift where design is increasingly able to try out multiple things early, roll them out for real, gather large amounts of data so we can make more of our decisions empirically as opposed to through barroom arguments. Um, and I think in that way, one of the other things that's happened is because we're seeing increasingly diverse kinds of computing that are increasingly accessible to people around the world, uh, we're seeing a shift in what computers are used for and what people uh, use computing to, to care about. I, was, uh, I helped organize a panel uh, for the National Academy of Engineering last week, and one of the people on these issues, and, and one of the people that I invited was uh, Kate Starbird from the University of Washington, who's been using Twitter and other forms of social media as a way of uh, getting feedback about disaster awareness. So when an earthquake strikes in Haiti, uh, she's able to work with uh, volunteers to coordinate social responses that are really helpful. And I think that's an example of social media being used uh, in a way that wasn't readily available until recently. Of course, people have always been communal, but the way that they're being communal is changing in the online world. With these diverse platforms, however, I think a number of technical challenges arise. And um, my research group is roughly divided. It sort of naturally has two major lobes to it. One of them explores the social experiences of technology, and the other explores the actual creation of the, the plumbing itself. And what we're seeing with these increasingly diverse platforms is that what makes a good user experience on diverse platforms is different. So it makes a good user experience for one of the walls that you might see here in Cal IT2 is really different than what makes a good user experience for a wristwatch. And what's interesting to me is that for every one of these form factors, well, maybe not every one, but most of these form factors, somebody has come up with a good user experience of some kind or other. But most apps are not set up for that particular form factor. So what you'll see is that there are great apps designed for the giant walls that we have in Cal IT2. 
but that's not available to most people and so your average website doesn't have much to offer out of the box for a large platform like this. So if our vision of design in the future is increasingly diverse devices, how can we enable the software itself or designers and software in conjunction to better adapt user interfaces for these different devices? Can we say, aha, we have a good example or a set of good examples of what makes good mobile phone apps. We're going to automatically adapt what we see on the desktop web to those smaller devices. And I think there are real opportunities there. In addition to the hardware, we're seeing also increasingly diverse software. And one thing that if you look at what computer science research was focused on, I would say that 15 years ago, the focus applications for computer science research were what you might call big software, things that ultimately went into the operating system, the web browser, uh, your, say, Photoshop or Office Suite or something else, things that take hundreds, probably thousands of developers, multiple years, uh, and are uh, millions or more lines of code. I've seen a real emphasis shift lately towards more opportunistic software, where we're seeing, uh, on one extreme, the weekend warrior who wants to be able to glue this to that and get uh, new information. Uh, I found my rental when I moved to San Diego by building an if this then that script for scraping Craigslist. So that's one or two lines of code that's useful for just me and that's about it. Uh, and I think in the middle you see a number of interesting applications. Lots of these in the university are being driven by the increasing use of computing across different disciplines. And so while 15 or 20 years ago, uh, most of the people using computer science were in uh, computer science and the hard sciences. Now we're seeing an increasing use of computing uh, across the university. Tomorrow I'm speaking in a computational social science workshop where most of the attendees come from the social sciences and are interested in harnessing the power of uh, big data and other things to be able to ask and answer social science questions. And that's a major shift. And I think we've also seen a shift in how design is moving you know, off the desktop and out into the world in terms of who's using computers. This is a, a picture that my former PhD student Neil Patel took. Uh, Neil ha now has a startup in Ahmedabad, India, where he works with small share farmers who are communicating with each other, uh, asking and answering crop questions, and also just socializing on a voice-based social media platform. Now, what works well, and the co both the content and the technology form factor and the user interface for small share farmers in the northwest of India is a really different user experience than what works well in, uh, in Palo Alto or San Diego. It's just a, it's a different mix of, of, of goals. And I think as we have this opportunity of looking at, well, what are the opportunities for communities um, using technology in new and interesting ways for activism, for social engagement, uh, for just asking and answering important information questions? Um, one natural thing to do, and you saw me do this already, is to look at a familiar technology that we like. For a lot of my research, that Muse has been the design studio. And ask, well, how could we do something like that in the online world or augmented by technology, maybe even still anchored in the physical world. And when we do this, I think we don't want to do, uh, this is a, a politician's website um, that mimics a, like a man cave or something like that. So if you want to get information about his website, you can click around on all these different things and you can click on the water cooler and something happens. And it's kind of a fun website. Like it's definitely more interesting than the average politician's website. But it's really hard to figure out what to, what to do with that. And so uh, I'm using this as a metaphor of suggesting that um, as we think about these new uh, communication modalities and community building opportunities, we shouldn't try to just automatically redo uh, what we see in the physical world. And this insight about design, it's, it's one of the most powerful lessons I've learned, uh, comes from a paper that Jim wrote um, and that I've taught for many years now. And uh, what was interesting is that Jim wrote a paper uh, in the context of looking at video conferencing and the phone system, 
where many people were looking at computers augmenting communication as being like video conferencing. And, and Jim's research group had said, you know, everybody, there's a lot more than you can do with computers besides doing like a, a crummy video replication of the richness of face-to-face -face meetings. Think about all the opportunities and all the ways that you can use comp computation, uh, including what if people had home pages that you could have information about themselves? That sure would be handy. Uh, and many of the ideas from that paper have, have since come to pass. And I think we have that same opportunity again now um, in, in a kind of second generation way of looking at new opportunities for community building. So in this seminar, what we're going to do is each week we'll have a speaker, um, mostly invited from outside, who will share their research. And what all of us are going to do is try and ask lots of questions. Uh, and for next week, I'll make sure to get more chairs. It's great to see this large turnout. I hadn't, I figured it would be like me and two other people. So, um, it's, uh, we'll, uh, we'll work on the, the room to make sure it has enough space. Um, and I'm going to post the list of speakers soon. We have two people who are, uh, probably but not definitely yet. So this weekend, I'll post that up online. Uh, and so you'll get a chance to hear about everything from, uh, for example, we have uh, Jane Manning talking about online learning. Uh, we'll have Sepp Kambar talking about crowdsourcing. Uh, we're going to have um, several people talking about social computing and looking at large-scale social experiments on things like Facebook. Um, uh, Eric Paulos is going to talk about activism and civic engagement. There's going to be a pretty wide variety of stuff. Um, that said, if you have ideas for speakers that you think we should bring to UCSD, send them my way. I had uh, some people that I knew well and was able to come and, and invite. But I think, and I think all of the talks that you'll see this fall are going to be awesome. They're all really great speakers. But they only scratch the surface of, of the number of possibilities and lots of ways of interpreting design at large in the world. And so if you have speakers that you think we should see uh, from arts, from computer science, from the social sciences, from anywhere on campus, or people that don't even fit into any of those boxes, um, they could be, you know, one person I've invited uh, who I'm hoping to be able to bring down at some point is Dan Soroker, who ran analytics for uh, the Obama campaign and brought many of the ideas that we'll, we'll see here in this seminar to modern elections and political campaigns. And he's since founded a company that uh, now produces software to make it uh, called Optimizely that makes it much easier to, to, for end users to create and run experiments online. So those are the kinds of things that I think are extremely interesting. Uh, and you should send me email with, with people that you have as, as ideas. Um, and today I'm going to try to, to make sure to end a little bit early so that we have questions both about uh, the research that I'll share and also about the format of the class or, or other logistics that you may be wondering about. And here's a good time to pause to gather the first set of those. I know it's the first day of classes and people aren't used to asking questions yet, but I bet there's at least a few. Yeah. Oh, so uh, this fall I'm teaching two classes. Uh, one of them is this seminar, which is a one-unit class, uh, pass-fail. Uh, if you show up, you get credit. Uh, if you ask great questions, I'll be thrilled. Uh, and that's the entire class. Um, and you can register that either as COGS 260 or as CSE 290. It's cross-listed. Um, I also am teaching a graduate research topics in HCI class which is a uh, let's read some awesome papers on human-computer interaction and do a small research project. Uh, and that'll meet over in the CSE building, so we'll read Jim's paper, for example, and, uh, and probably several other people in this room as well. And uh, that meets over in CSE Monday and Wednesday afternoons. The info is on, on my website. I like a class with easy logistics show up and you get credit because that minimizes the number of administrative questions. Yeah? 
Yeah, I wanted to make sure that, well, so probably is the simplest answer to the question, this is the new permanent location. Um, we'll see, I have no idea how attendance is gonna vary across the weeks, whether this is the tip of the iceberg and it will double, or whether everybody showed up for the first day and like next time it'll be Jay and I hanging out. Um, and uh, I think anything is possible. Um, this building is nice because it's not owned by a department, and so I hope that people from across campus will come. Um, so it will be somewhere in here, and uh, if the attendance stays like this, we may move downstairs, but we'll, we'll play it by ear. Yeah? Any prior background in FCI necessary for either of these things? So for this class, there's no background required, um, both because uh, we're not testing you on anything, so this is really a you should come if it's interesting and you get something out of it. There's, there's no more to it than that. Um, for my graduate class, I'll, t I'll talk more about that on Monday. Uh, if you're curious, come and, uh, and I'll answer all the questions about that then. But great, great question. Bill. I just, since a lot of people came in since you started, I should remind there are two lists going around, one for people to put their email addresses on for to get to find if their room change, and two is for attendance for the class. Yeah, that's right. So the pink list is the attendance list, and the black clipboard, I think it is, the darker clipboard, is the mailing list. So um, at any point, so after today, I won't send out any spam blasts with talk announcements. You can find it either on the website or by... Uh, or by signing up on this list, which will be available at the end of class if you're stuck somewhere that this doesn't easily get to. And for people taking it for credit, you can uh, sign up on the pink list for attendance. Um, so I had two projects that both went at large sort of accidentally, and I wanted to share both of them with you uh, briefly to give you a feel for the kinds of things that, that I've been thinking about the past couple of years. Um, one of them is that my postdoc, Stephen Dow, and I were interested in getting a better understanding of prototyping and what makes for an effective design practice and prototyping practice. And, um, well, to make that concrete, I'll show you the first set of stuff that we used for running experiments uh, and then what we learned out of that. So we started running experiments where we would ask people to make an egg drop device, so make a contraption that protects an egg from a fall from really high up, and you want the egg to survive. And here's an example of that. Here we have an egg, goes into this contraption, built out of everyday materials. You drop it out of the third floor window, bam. And this one actually survives the fall from uh, my office, I don't know, 40 or so feet up. How many people have built one of these, like in high school or college? Well, yeah, a lot of people. Uh, anecdotally, the, we tested, we would grab anybody and everybody we could to build these and, and try out different uh, strategies for prototyping. Uh, anecdotally, the product design students were the best and the theoretical mechanical engineering students were the worst. So it was really funny to see two halves of the exact same department forming the two extrema for, uh, for building these. Uh, it's a totally fun uh, icebreaker research group activity. We did it in my research group one day at lunch. It was really fun. And what was interesting about doing this is that um, you saw all of these diverse designs, but when we talked to people afterwards about how they picked their design, um, people gave us uh, some really surprising answers, and I'll play this for you. I hope the audio works. The last video is really fun. We'll see if we can get to it. No, I, I don't know. For we'll play these once more in case you didn't hear it the first time.
just had one idea and I was going to try and make it work. I kind of went with the whole parachute idea and what I had from the beginning. So. This is the best approach for such a design. <laughs> I love showing this video because we've all been this guy where we think that the way that we're thinking about the problem is not only the best way, but the only possible way. And uh, there's good research to back this up. So if you've had the experience of being the person who is stuck, you're not alone. And the good news is that there's help for you. This is a set of experiments that the psychologist Carl Dunker ran in the 1940s on a phenomenon he called functional fixation. He gave people problems like this. Uh, you may have seen some of these. Uh, given these materials, affix the candle to the wall so that none of the wax drips on the table. About 20% of people come up with a solution to it. Um, and if you're coming in late, there are, there's definitely plenty of space around the wall. So if you want to move in from the door, that can let people who are hiding out be able to come in. What he found was that you know, here's a solution, which is you use the box that holds the tax as the vessel to catch the candle wax. And what's notable about this process is that if you give people this exact same set of materials, only with the tax dumped out of the box, then nearly everybody comes up with this solution. So what was inspiring for me about this as a designer is that you look at this set of materials, you can give people the same thing, but with just a tiny tweak, and it dramatically changes the creativity of the solution outcome. So I was curious about whether we could do this in a domain general way. And um, also by this point, Stephen and I had spent a year throwing egg drop devices out of the third and fourth floor windows. And my computer science colleagues were beginning to wonder like a little bit what was going on here. <laughs> So we thought it was time to get back to software. The challenge of running experiments like this is that you need some measure of success. And the egg drop device is great because you can measure, well, how high did it go before it cracked? But um, it's hard to find other stuff like that. And eventually what we hit on was the insight that you can use uh, advertisements, roll them out on the real web measure things like click rate and time on site. And that becomes your dependent variable for a study. And that was what transformed our research from kind of a, a classic drag people on campus to come in uh, and, and run studies and, and opened it up initially to drag people on campus to come in, but then roll the experiments out uh, online. And this is my own personal experience with, with this paradigm. But I think it's changing a lot of both computer science and, and social science research. How many here, people here have used Mechanical Turk? A lot. It's a really valuable resource. Um, and, and I think it's actually changing the bandwidth of how much social science gets done in a year. It used to be the case that the amount of new knowledge that could be added to psychology in a given year was roughly proportional to the number of students who took psychology one. <laughs> that's the bandwidth limiting factor. Um, now, that's not true in all cases. But, but uh, if, if you'll forgive me for a caricature, uh, that's a, a, a dominant term in the amount of knowledge that can be added to the world. Um, and it also meant that if you wanted to add knowledge to the world, you had to have a group of psychology one students at the ready nearby. And so that limited both what got done and who got to do it. And looking at the web as an experimental platform changes both of those pretty dramatically. So what we did uh, is we took two different uh, process interventions. One is asking people to uh, make a prototype, get feedback, revise it, get feedback, and on and on, serial prototyping, what we commonly do with iterative design. And the other one was to try parallel prototyping, where people would try a couple of alternatives in parallel, get feedback on them. Uh, and then go from there. And just like our egg drop device, people came up with all sorts of stuff. Notably, those that we assigned to the parallel condition produced ads that got more clicks than those in the serial condition. And for me, this is pretty cool, because obviously the people who are on the web clicking have no idea uh, not only which condition these ads were produced in, but even that they're uh, providing the measure for an experiment. 
Uh, and notably, they spent a whole lot more time on the site that the ad was for. So we're seeing that we're getting, in some sense, the right people more with these parallel ads. They're communicating the value proposition better. Uh, and experts like them better, too. One worry that often people have is if you're going to monkey around with design, you'll come up with stuff that the hoi polloi may like, but that the experts will, will totally hate. Uh, and maybe that's fine, depending on whether or not you're the kind of person who's an expert judging designs. But in this case, uh, it was good news that both the experts uh, and the hoi polloi uh, agreed on, on the process. Notably, the designs that emerged uh, were also more diverse. And I think one reason for this is that we see that, uh, as Dedry Gentner and colleagues have shown, comparison aids learning. And so in her work, she's looked at things like improving the business school case study model, where you see a case and talk about it, see a case and talk about it. Her insight is that um, given how fundamental analogical reasoning is to cognition, uh, why don't we have people try and build analogical structures, or the, the less highfalutin way of saying that is, uh, tell me about the similarities and the differences. What are the parallels between these situations? And when people do that, when people explicitly think about parallels, their ability to transfer that knowledge to a new sim setting goes up dramatically. And I think we see that in parallel prototyping also. Um, here, one thing that you're doing is you're explicitly, uh, in this case, describing. I think we also see this in a lot of group activities. So the next thing that we did is we were interested in, well, a lot of design happens in groups with teams, not just individuals. If we have teams do stuff, um, would that gather a win for, for sharing multiple designs? And so in an experiment that used the same paradigm, just uh, now with teams uh, sharing designs, uh, multiple or each individual's best, we get a big boost for teams where the individuals share multiple designs. And it's not just in the numbers. Uh, you see that in terms of uh, how broadly people explore or borrow from each other. They talk better. They achieve better consensus. And interestingly, at the end of the experiment, uh, if you ask the team uh, how well their group is doing, how cohesive they feel, only in the share multiple uh, condition did the cohesion go up. In the other conditions, the cohesion actually went down. And you can see because it's like a my design or your design. And that induces stress rather than what you see with the share multiple, which is a, a best of both worlds. So that's an example of how um, our exploration of design process led us from a, a traditional in the lab model to something that leveraged design at scale. Um, we had the same experience in the, in the learning world, where um, I've been teaching studio classes for a bunch of years. As you know by now, I love the studio model. The first studio class I taught went well, except that uh, one element on the end of course questionnaire was quite low. Uh, the question, how fair is the grading, was in the 13th percentile. And uh, when I thought about it, teaching a design class in the School of Engineering where most things have right or wrong answers and design isn't that clear cut, uh, I kind of got where the students were coming from. Uh, and so I spent a number of years building up materials to try and help convey what is good design. And one of them that I explored is getting students to assess their own work. Because I think that often what happens is like you do a project or for academics, you write a paper and you think whatever you think about it as submitting it, but you rarely think about it from the assessor's perspective. Um, also, I had the theory that if students assessed their own work, they couldn't complain about the grades. So I thought that was a, a benefit, too. And uh, so we have a process where every week you uh, do projects, share them in studio, and then assess their, their own work using these rubrics. And this is. Um, really similar to, and in fact, the next thing I'm going to talk about is inspired by a lot of the work that Ed Hutchins and, and other folks here have been doing. And part of the rule is that um, if you, you assess your own assignment and a TA assesses your work bl blind to each other's grades, if they're close, you get your own grade. 
If they're not, you get the TA's grade. And that's just like a, a safeguard. Um, if there's any game theorists in the audience today, you may realize a, a challenge of this safeguard. And a student came up to me after class one day and said, um, this is totally terrible because it's unfair. What if you guess uh, what your TA is going to grade you, and you increment yourself four and a half points uh, to get a higher grade? You could artificially uh, increase your grade using this system. And what I explained to the student was that I was like, what I shared it to the whole class the next day is, well, if you're so good at being able to know the person who's assessing you that you can accurately estimate what they'll give you and do so week after week, adding four and a half to that, but not anymore because then you would trip the scales and go over and lose all that benefit, uh, then I'm more than happy to give you the, the four points of increased grade that derives from that because the, the theory of mind skill that you'll have at the end of that is so important for life success that uh, it's easily worth four points in a class. We found, as a lot of people have, that if you try self-assessment, uh, it works pretty well. Um, and we get the majority of students getting their own grade. We also see things that you see in the literature in general, which is that high performers have high standards for themselves and, uh, and underrate, and, and low performers the opposite. And so in this way, self-assessment becomes a really nice mirror uh, for a number of things in addition to how well did you do on, on this particular assignment. A couple of years ago, we had the opportunity um, to think about uh, scaling this up. And, and my colleagues approached me about teaching a, a massive online class. Uh, and I said, sure. Um, but I was only going to do the lectures part, because how on earth could you get uh, you know, thousands of people around the globe doing design projects that just seemed crazy? Um, and, then, and then I came down here and, and talked with Ed Hutchins. And he told me about how uh, he was using calibrated peer review uh, for teaching several hundred person classes here. Uh, and so I went back up to Stanford and, and talked with Daphne Kohler and we kind of felt like, well, let's do it. Um, and so, because we had all of the peer assessment materials that I'd been using for years, uh, so we worked together working with Coursera to expand calibrated peer assessment to a global online class. Uh, this system was first used in my HCI class and it's since been used in more than 80 other massive online classes. Everything from mathematical thinking and programming Python to understanding world music, uh, health and nutrition, uh, all across the map, introduction to sociology, lots of different stuff. And what's pretty cool is that on the whole, uh, this peer assessment process works pretty darn well. Uh, it works well enough for a pass-fail class. And if you run it in person, like, uh, like Ed does in his classes here, uh, it can work much better when you have a, a more homogenous group. And, uh, and it can be used for lots of other purposes also. In addition to the scoring, one, one thing that I think is really notable is that students uh, report that the learning benefit they got from self and peer assessment was extremely high. So on self-report scales, the, the, the graph leans way, way to the right. And I think that's really exciting because that's an extremely important learning benefit. But this doesn't happen automatically. So one, one benefit of design at scale is that um, when you bake pedagogy into software, it's easy to automatically have the same idea propagate to lots of classes because it's baked in the same software as opposed to different teachers just doing different things. Um, and where there are differences, uh, by virtue of this being a web service, you have the ability to capture more and measure more than was previously accessible. And what we saw is that different classes took this basic framework but used it in very different ways. And so we've been able to measure how different classes have more and less success uh, with, with these, these approaches. And we've seen that there are some patterns for uh, doing peer assessment well, which, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Also, you have the opportunity to run lots of experiments. So uh, now that we've got a class and a platform, we run, I don't know, we're almost up to a new experiment every week. 
of some flavor or another in online education. And here's just one example. Um, what if we give people feedback about their grading? So we did pretty good where people were grading without getting any feedback about how well they did. And it turns out that if you give them feedback, uh, it improves further, but that people overcorrect. And so by trying out, out these interface designs with real students taking real classes, we've been able to improve the feedback messaging that we give to people to improve, improve both the quality of their learning uh, and uh, and the, the the output that we get out of this system. Um, another example of an experiment that we've run is uh, this is so far we've talked about just numerical feedback. Another thing that we tried is qualitative feedback. So we codified a bunch of common responses for the, all of those of you who have TA'd. You know that for any individual assignment, there's like eight things that are really common that students want to get feedback on. So there's eight really common errors. And so we just wrote them all down and we put them on the grading website and encouraged students to copy one of those if it was relevant and add a because. And we call these fortune cookies for their ability to be general purpose feedback that can apply to many different situations. And. Uh, it's worked uh, extremely well. We're finding that about uh, three quarters of students give this feedback. And I think it's because it leverages the classic HCI principle of converting a recall problem to a recognition problem. And what I mean by this is uh, if you're on a command line, I had this uh, yesterday where I was moving some stuff over to a UCSD server. And we had to remember, what's the syntax for SCP? And you see, well, it's going to be source destination, but the username goes here. It took a little while. We actually looked it up on the web. Boom, go. Now, in a graphical interface, there's no need to recall the parameters because they're all expressed in one way or another on the screen. Uh, and we see that same benefit that here, by expressing the stuff on the screen, it's easier to get people to generate things. So through running a number of experiments online, and also through doing data analytics on stuff that was out there in the wild, uh, we have found a number of principles that seem to work well for doing peer assessment online, like having assignment-specific materials, uh, iterating before release, assessing yourself after the peers, uh, per ha having staff grades to get <coughs> ground truth, uh, doing smart things to aggregate the grades. You can use algorithms to improve the quality here. Uh, having these fortune cookies and then giving people feedback about the quality of their assessment. We've also done some explorations on machine grading. And what's fun about these is they're all uh, on real classes. And so with uh, this example comes from the HCI class. For the midterm and the final, we had peers grade uh, to gather ground truth. We had staff grade. And then we had an, um, an algorithm grade. And so we looked at how well can we do by the machine approach, by the peer approach, and uh, what are their merits. And so you can see how the peer uh, system here is they're checking attributes of answers that are correct or incorrect, which is a slightly different system than uh, giving, a, giving a score directly. Uh, it turns out that the attribute orientation, I thought that it would improve it. It doesn't seem to. Uh, one thing I love about running these experiments in the online setting is that um, my friend Stu Card talks about he really wants to be either right or wrong. And what he means by that is like it's really easy to have an opinion where you're like, the way it ought to work is this. And so when I told my students that we should do it this particular way, I was like, and clearly this is going to be better. And by being able to run it online and gather the data uh, and compare it to other uh, approaches that we've tried. We were able to see that it worked pretty well, but the thing that we had before worked pretty well too. So we didn't actually get much of a win here. My hunch is that we can improve this and it will eventually be better. But the ability to gather data checks us from just having random opinions. You know, even ones based on a fair amount of expertise, uh, but still just random opinions. And uh, what we found is that uh, the machine learning algorithm that we're using that was developed by, by Richard Sotra, an NLP student, um, 
can in many cases perform about as well as a human grader. Now, there's, there's a couple of caveats here uh, before you tweet that machine wor uh, grading works great. Um, the first one is that uh, we've found that uh, the errors that machines and people make are different. Machines are stingy graders, whereas people are forgiving graders. So if a machine grades something to be right, it is very likely to be right. And that makes sense. I mean, obviously, these results are, in some sense, particular to the particular algorithm that we have. But I think there are more fundamental reasons why that tends to be true, uh, which is that if you have a machine learning algorithm that's using NLP and a bunch of training data, if people use the same word soup as the training answer, then they are likely to get a score similar to the training data. But if you would express it in a different way, a machine has a harder time knowing what to do with it. So if it sees something that it recognizes as right, it says, yup, and it probably is. Um, but sometimes it will grade things as wrong that were alternate formulations that were correct. Uh, Humans, on the other hand, are lenient. They, they do the, well, I could tell they probably meant to give me the right answer, even if what they wrote down was not quite right. Uh, and so that's the, that's the challenge of human graders. Uh, in principle, we ought to be able to combine these uh, to do a better job so you get some cool cyborg hybrid that is better than either of them could be on their own. We haven't actually built one that works better than either on their own yet. But I think that's one example. And I think we're going to see lots of cases of design at large where some combination of uh, human intelligence may be expressed through crowdsourcing or human computation and increasing machine intelligence through advanced machine learning algorithms can give you something better. Question? Uh, are peers always right, or can they also make mistakes? Uh, peers also make mistakes. So for example, you'll see on the first question of the midterm, uh, peer, an individual peer grader agreed with the staff assigned grade 70% of the time. So for, and there are more than, uh, there's several possible answers. So 70% is actually a pretty good accuracy rate. Um, but there are a significant fraction of, there's a significant minority of uh, responses where the peers and the staff don't agree. They tend to be that the peers are overly lenient. Um, now that we know that, you could imagine changing the peer grading instructions that are like, now don't just give them any grade just because you're a nice guy. Um, maybe we could do something like that. What I wanted to close with today was to wind back to where we started, of thinking about the opportunities for uh, leveraging scale, in particular uh, in terms of community. And if we look at the um, design studio that we started with at the beginning, and we were inspired by the community that we saw there, um, if we move a lot of this stuff online, sure, we get all sorts of scientific benefits and process benefits and other stuff that we've seen today being able to try multiple versions and run them, being able to scale things up and run experiments more efficiently, being able to source ideas from the crowd. Uh, but we may end up in a world where we're each at our laptops on our own uh, and no longer uh, involved communally. And my grandfather, I was talking to him recently, he refuses to use uh, email and the internet. And it's because he's seen his, his peer group uh, that uses the internet has shut themselves off socially. And ironically, it means I talk to him a lot less than I otherwise would because email is, is the most natural thing for me. Um, but, uh, but I think that's a really interesting opportunity. And so one thing that we've done is we've rolled out a video uh, conversation system so that students in classes like social psychology and photography and reasoning uh, can hop online and have a multi-way video discussion uh, with their peers uh, about, in the social psychology case, uh, racism, sexism, homophobia, other hot button issues, where I think the opportunity to have that discussion globally is pretty darn interesting. 
uh, and opens up a lot of possibilities that would be different than having this discussion in a residential college like UCSD or Wesleyan. And uh, the initial results from this are just coming in, and uh, it seems to be really promising. It all, also raises the question of, as we're doing this stuff, what, how do we know whether we won? Uh, is our goal to have a, a kumbaya moment where people feel greater empathy for their peers around the world? Or are we hoping that if you have these discussions, not only will you recognize the real world import of social psychology, but it may inspire you to participate more in the class or do better or be in, engaged in some other way. And, uh, and I think those are, those are interesting things to think about. Um, for any of you that are interested in, uh, in doing research in this area, I think there's a lot of opportunities. And my hope is that some of the speakers that we have come in this fall uh, will get a chance to talk with many of you and that you'll be able to get advice from them and feedback from them on your own research. Um, if you're interested in particular in online education, UCSD has a number of resources available. Uh, my group at UCSD and Stanford has built uh, a bunch of open source software and data analysis scripts and tutorial videos and community sites and other things. And so if you thought that this was a, a handy way, a, a platform or a vehicle for your own research, uh, for example, one, one experiment we're running this week is on uh, mindset change. If we, in collaboration with psychologists, if we uh, either measure or manipulate students' mindsets about taking an online class, does that change the quality of their work and their, their persistence? And so these online vehicles can be uh, a mechanism for, for doing fundamental social science uh, research. Uh, here are the other classes that I, that I mentioned in my email and at the beginning of the seminar today, uh, which soon, hopefully this weekend, I'll have some time to put those up uh, online. And uh, that, with that, I'll close for today and take any questions you have about research, logistics, anything else. Yes? So I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, based on what you were talking about. So the, the last topic you touched upon, the grading between uh, graded performance between machines and humans. Yeah. Isn't that essentially like, it's almost like a definition problem from artificial intelligence. And this particular case, it's NLP. And the design approach that you're proposing is that effectively let's restrict the domain that we need to analyze and try to have performance by machines, which is similar to that of humans. Is that understanding correct? Um, that's sort of right. So uh, I, I, think, I think your question gets at multiple things. So there are, there are lots of assignments that in an ideal world, we, there are, or there are lots of ways of assessing performance that we would love to have in an ideal world both in physical classes and in online classes, we restrict those to things that we know how to grade. And for an in-person class, that'll be essays and exams and things like that. For an online class that originally used to be multiple choice questions or computer programs. But what we've been able to do is through peer assessment, expand out the set of things that people do and slowly, we're increasing the set of stuff that machines can grade. I think there are, so there's some limitations. So uh, we're not yet even close to the point where a machine learning algorithm could assess the quality uh, of your analysis of Nietzsche's philosophy. That's just, you know, the subtlety involved in that is more than current machine learning algorithms can do. And even beyond that, one reason why we have uh, canned assessment is that it's easy to handle. You can imagine that in the future, as opposed to taking a programming exam, uh, an agent might just watch you program for a month and provide you either learning feedback or for an employer a numerical score or, or qualitative analysis. And so over the next 10, 20, 30 years, there, if we want to go this way, there's a lot of opportunity for uh, uh, what one of my colleagues calls free-range assessment. So where the assessment's not confined, it gets to, to roam wild. And I think that's a cool opportunity. And the second thing was with regards to, uh, so you had mentioned that uh, 
uh, the study showed that people learn quicker when they're making similarities or finding similarities between solutions. Yeah. Uh, but haven't there been older studies which talk about uh, the fact that if you learn uh, from analogs, then uh, I mean you're not basically understanding the solution in a more fundamental way, so to speak. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the. Sure, yeah. So. Uh, If my cognitive science colleagues in the room will forgive me, I'll, I'll summarize the, the findings of cognitive science in two sentences as uh, anal uh, analogy is central, analogical reasoning is central to cognition, uh, even a fundamental mechanism. But humans are really crummy at analogical reasoning. That's like one of the, uh, that's a real paradox of the research. And, and so Dedry Gentner has devoted her career, in essence, to trying to understand that paradox. And the classic research is you do something like, you take med students and you say, there's a general. He wants to attack a city. So he goes from two directions so that uh, the residents of the city don't see a large army coming because it's split. Now, you're in a medical setting, and you can uh, zap the cancer. How do you want to do it to minimize damage to the patient? And medical students will reliably say, I have no idea, uh, when, of course, all they need to do is apply the analogy from one case to another. So people are often bad at that. And a lot of the research that, that Dedry's done and some of the work that I've done has been to try and figure out, well, how do, you know, how do we get people to do that? Because business school students read these case studies, and it appears to go in one year and, and out the other. Uh, and that's not even talking about ethics. Um, so <laughs> you know, can we, can we get it to stick? I have, I have a question. And that, that's, I, I do want to uh, model ending on time well. So, but uh, I'm happy to stay for as long as people have questions. But uh, I want to thank all of you for coming, and we'll wrap up for today. Uh, there's a chance that the elevator won't go down to the first floor, so you may have to take the stairs down to the first floor from the second floor. So you ought to be able to at least hit two. I got an email this morning. Did we tell you about the elevator outage this afternoon? <laughs> so you can try exiting by uh, the elevator to the first floor. If that doesn't work, you can hit the second. But I'll stay around for anybody who has uh, further questions.